about as much metallurgy as you will ever need to know as a welder is right here. It's a good, it's a really good $10 go-to book. Metals and How to Weld Them by the James F. Lincoln Foundation. That's a best kept secret. You have to, you have to kind of search for it. It's not the Lincoln Electric website. It's the James F. Lincoln Foundation website. Now the reason I even bring up the metals and how to weld them book is there's some really good sound metallurgy fundamentals in there that come into play when welding something like this. Again, this is a low alloy, high strength steel that will harden if it heats up beyond a transition temperature and then cools too quickly. So the thing we want to do with the preheat is slow the cooling rate. Also, I'm heating it up here just for, just for fit-up purposes because it's a pinch fit and that pin will not even fit in the hole until I get this thing expanded beyond a certain, a certain temperature. So I'm using a little IR gun there to, to check my preheat. And how much preheat is enough? Well, the carbon equivalent comes into play there. What the carbon equivalent means is that other elements have an effect on hardening as well and can be the equivalent of a higher carbon content. Like this has got chromium, molybdenum, uh, a little bit of manganese, and, and a few other elements in there that kind of like gives it the equivalent of a 0.6 carbon content. Now there are preheat charts and preheat calculators available that will give you a recommended minimum preheat. Now I checked, I checked in uh, 500 degrees Fahrenheit is about right for the carbon equivalent of these parts and that's going to wind up being roughly a little bit past a uh, blue tint. I'm going to keep this rosebud torch moving around, moving around and that big thick piece is going to take a little bit more heat so I'm focusing on it right now. I already kind of heated the bottom piece up and the flame playing over there even just as I come to the bottom of the big thick pin is going to keep the bottom piece pretty warm. But I need to really focus on that thick piece and make sure to get it saturated with heat, get it up to a little bit over 500 degrees before I even put the first tack on this thing. Because I did some testing on some, some sample pieces without any preheat and even tacking it. Uh, if I wasn't careful, I got cracks in the tacks, which wasn't a big surprise. But it lets me know that the preheat is very important on this metal. Now a little review. Why preheat at all? Well, preheat does a couple of things. The main thing is it slows the cooling rate. And the secondary benefits are it drives off moisture that might be on the surface, which has hydrogen in it. And hydrogen is a problem for low alloy steels. Now a good example of the, the, of the hardenability of carbon steels and the effect that carbon has is cast iron. It has a lot of carbon in it, like upwards of three full percent. Now if I puddle this corner of this uh, exhaust manifold, it's just like heating something to red hot and then dunking it in cold water. It quenches really quickly from all that mass around it. Now I'll run a file over it. In this case, the file doesn't even scratch it. It got so hard. Now that's the test I'll do on metals that, I don't, that I'm not sure of the con, uh, composition on. And I, knew, I would know if I was testing this metal that I was going to give me some problems. Now that's not near the extreme. I'm not going to have near that problem with this low alloy steel. Just to give you an idea of what happens when you heat and quench something that's got enough carbon in it to harden. Now this, even these flame cut areas of this low alloy steel hardened and were tough to machine. But I want you to notice the quality of these, the, of these plasma cuts here very unusual to get a cut that smooth and, and so for that reason I want to definitely give a little shout out to Southern Tool Steel in, in Chattanooga where we ordered these parts cut from. They plasma cut them for us. They were very reasonable, a pleasure to do business with. I dealt with a girl named Rachel who was just a sweetheart and so I would recommend doing business with these people. That's southerntoolsteel.com and there's their 800 number. Now there's the pallet of stuff. You can see we're making a little bit of progress from the uh, ones that are just decked and then some machining done and now we've got about 20 of them with hole patterns and just about ready to weld. And so we're going to preheat each one and work through the whole process. And this is part one of, the, of a two-part series here where we're just going to preheat, we're going to get some tack welds, I'm going to weld one side and then one pass on the other side and then we'll follow up with a, a second part two talking about some other stuff. Now I'm speeding this up considerably here. It took, took about two to three solid minutes of heating to get that pin up to temperature. And I'm pretty sure you didn't want to watch all two to three minutes of it. Same thing over and over again. But again, you can kind of you get an idea on something that's shiny like this. Um, 
what color the heat tent's going to be when it's at the temperature you need it. Now I'm using an infrared gun here to kind of get an idea. And so I've got it up above 500 degrees here before I get that first tack on there. So I'm going to get one tack just to make sure it doesn't move, even though it should be all swelled up in there and, and locked in now because it was such a tight fit. I just want to get one tack on this side before I flip it over and then, and then weld the other side. And I'm welding the other side because weld sequencing can help you uh, maintain and control heat. And what this is going to do is it's going to put a little heat in there and it's going to be easier to maintain that 500 degree preheat once I weld the other side. So I like to go along on this low alloy steel like this. I'm not in any hurry. I want a nice kind of like a slow travel speed. I don't want anything heating and cooling really quickly. And again, I did some experiments and I used some fast, fast travel speed and got some center line cracking. That was no good. So I'm just going to take it easy, go slow, not get any crater cracks. going to taper off the amperage really slowly and uh, keep an eye on it. I'm using uh, regular old mild steel ER70 filler metal on this, even though it's a, it's a high strength steel. The... the uh, weld metal was not specced out on the drawing and so I'm, I'm oftentimes I'll use undermatched filler metal you know when, when given the chance because the strength of this part really is in the design not in the welds and you can see I'm propping right directly on that 500 degree Fahrenheit metal with my TIG finger and that lets me make this whole weld here without cooking my finger otherwise I'd get to get a stack of two befores or something like that and, and find a way to prop my my palm and I don't have to do that I can just prop right wherever I want to a little quick check before I put the first pass on this side just make sure I'm up above 500 and we'll again we'll prop the pinky tig finger on there and go again you can see I'm using a water-cooled torch here I'm using a water-cooled CK flex lock because I'm using quite a bit of amperage here and just just the, the air cooled that I tried to start with just got way too hot Again, going along nice and slow. I'm keeping the rod in the puddle. I don't see any reason not to in this particular, or for, for this particular joint. I'm welding good and hot, taking it nice and easy, moving along at a nice, fairly slow rate. Taper off nice and slow to avoid cracks. Here I've sped, the, sped it up just so you can kind of see the hand motion because I'm moving so slow. Otherwise you can't really get an idea on positioning of hands and filler metal and things like that. Also if you want to make sure to, to get that flow that metal down into the root, just want to watch it and make sure this is probably the technique to use. Just dipping in and out and watching the front of that puddle to make sure that the front of the puddle is wetting into the root already. The, the strength of this is in the design. The weight of this thing is actually uh, kind of sideways something's going to rest in that uh, on that machined out area of that big pin and so even if it just had practically if it had just tack welds on it it would hold no matter what but I'm following the blueprint the, the drawing there's a there's a weld sizes and weld symbols called out on this drawing it's just not specified what process or filler metal to use so one pass does not quite does not quite achieve the minimum weld leg size for what the drawing called out so it's going to require a second pass around all these things and that'll that'll come in part two all right that was part one stay tuned for part two and we're going to put that second pass on here as we, and, and talk about a lot more stuff and wrap up this little two-part thing on tig welding low alloy steels i hope you can easily understand the the big benefit of having a prop in your pocket where you can prop on preheated metal 500 degree metal on being able to just take a TIG finger out of your pocket, put it on your pinky, and prop right next to where you're going to weld no matter what. Don't be afraid to invest in yourself. Go grab one. You can see that at weldmongerstore.com.